On the night of October 28th, 2012, my father and I watched baseball. It's a love that we'll always share. As a boy, the best part of my game was getting hit by pitches, but my father was a natural athlete. In fact, as a boy, he made his hometown's all-star team as a third baseman. At the time, his hometown was a town of tens of thousands of people, and so to make the team was a very big deal. I remember him telling me that the night that he made the team, he was so proud, he slept in his uniform. But he was a gifted athlete, so I, he was a track and field star in high school. His senior year, he was the fourth fastest individual in Massachusetts in the 100-yard dash. I used to wear his track jacket around. So that night, the Giants played the Tigers in the World Series, and if the Giants won, they'd have an opportunity to clinch. But my father and I were not particularly invested in the outcome. We just kept the game on in the background and didn't really pay attention. The uh, hospital had about two or three dozen stations, and we'd been through the rotation several times already. So eventually, the Giants won, and the celebration loop continuously muted in the background. Dad ate dinner, and it hurt to see him struggle to do this. The cancer he'd been diagnosed with at that point had mostly deprived him of the use of his right arm. Just over 100 days prior, he had been diagnosed with glioblastoma multiform, which is one of the most aggressive forms of brain cancer an individual can have. And at stage four, it's in its most advanced stage. The research that my family and I had done gave us very little hope and the medical staff did their best to manage our expectations gently. Dad grew tired, and we spent the time together silently, and he said he was tired, that I could go. So I gave him a hug and kissed him goodnight and told him I loved him. He said he loved me too, as was our ritual. And those were the last words I spoke to my father. About two hours after I arrived home, the medical staff called and asked me and my family to come back. So we stayed with my father that night and into the next morning, and then he passed. We held him the entire time and told him repeatedly how much he was loved. If I can find any solace at all in my father's passing, it's, it's typically in three things. It's when he was diagnosed first, the outpouring of love and affection and support that he received was overwhelming. He described it as extremely gratifying. He received cards, calls, visits from acquaintances spanning a spectrum of decades. He knew how much he was loved and how many people he touched. And that made him and will always make him the rarest among us. Second, it's that if this were to be his sentence, it was carried out quickly. Dad did not suffer for an extended period of time, and, and anyone who's had to experience cancer knows that that's not always the case. And lastly, and this means most to me personally, it's that there was nothing left unsaid between my father and I. And I know from talking with peers that not everyone is this fortunate. Everyone grieves differently. Anyone who's lost anyone they care about knows how deep, deep that the darkness around us can be. So to deal with this darkness, I wrote. I've found the deeper I get into my quote-unquote adult life, writing helps in a variety of ways. I took up a fiction piece about recreating loved ones in virtual reality. So as part of my research, I put forth a question to my Facebook community. If you had a few moments, just a few more moments, with someone that you lost, someone who meant a great deal to you, what would you do? So I expected a response, absolutely. Um, the passion that fueled the responses surprised me. And it, it, there was a consistency to them. I would, you know, with one more moment, 
I would laugh, I would cry, I would hug them. They're, they're, you could feel the tangibility, this, this need to seize that, that opportunity. And one stuck out in particular is, is something that summed up sort of the theme of all of the responses. I would ask the questions I had never asked, and I would say the things that I had never said. And the theme that resonated through all of the responses was that the need for closure. So when we lose someone, there are snippets of them left behind. There's, there, there are video uh, clips, there's audio clips, there's photos. But what if we could recreate someone to a degree where closure actually felt authentic? Would it be possible? With the advent of virtual reality technology, we are rapidly coming up to a time when it very well may be. If you're not familiar with the term chatbot, it's essentially a response mechanism. If you haven't heard the term, if you're not familiar with the technology, you probably have heard of Apple's Siri, which is the most well-known. And by a response mechanism, you ask it a question or you put forth a request for information and the program sorts through an historical pool of possible options and gives you the best and most appropriate answer. It's a combination of machine learning and big data. Big data is all the possible responses. And the machine learning is the program's capability to independently pick the best response, configure it, and give it to you. If you're familiar with uh, pop culture, maybe you've seen the movie Iron Man with uh, Tony Stark, who plays Iron Man. He has his suave and wisecracking sidekick, Jasper, which is really just a chatbot. It provides him with information, status updates, maybe inspiration. And to take it a degree further, if you've seen the movie Her, you might be familiar with a chatbot that's evolved beyond machine learning into artificial intelligence. And that is not only is it capable of independently looking through historical pools of data, it can program itself to learn and evolve. In the movie Her, the operating system is known as Samantha. And the owner, the user, Theo, finds it so intuitive and so powerful that Theo actually falls in love with Samantha. And before you scoff and say that that's not possible, that technology can't be that powerful, or that people could never be so susceptible to that type of connection, consider this. It's already happening. A few years ago, a Belarusian entrepreneur named Roman Mazarenko believed that death was something hackable, something we could transcend, if not in our physical form, then in a digital format. We could recreate ourselves digitally, that there, was enough, there were enough artifacts scattered across our digital landscapes in terms of Facebook posts, blog posts, texts, emails, voicemail messages, video clips, that we could actually reincarnate someone in digital format. His collaborator and girlfriend Eugenia Kudya believed the same. So they set out to develop this chatbot program. Three years and a month after my father's passing, Roman was crossing a busy Moscow street when he was struck by a car and killed. Eugenia took it upon herself to deal with her grief by resurrecting Roman and created him in chatbot format. So was it effective, you might ask? She caught herself one night at a party, surrounded by actual living, breathing, physical beings, chatting back and forth with Roman, and realized she'd been doing it for about half an hour. This chatbot functionality will manifest itself within the virtual environment, and when it does, it teases the question, will we be able eventually to live in a universe of our own design? To effectively anticipate virtual reality, we can take a look at the past and consider historical adoption trends and usage patterns. In terms of computing, the trend has always facilitated independence and a customization of experience. Mainframe computing gave way to desktop computing, gave way to laptop computing, then to mobile devices and smartphones. And the idea is to make sure that we're connected wherever we are, that it's easier to be producing powerful content in the palm of your hand, no matter where you are. As far as the internet is concerned, 
how it's flown through these devices. The internet debuted as portal sites like Yahoo's GeoCities, which eventually gave way to the unique combination of websites we all preferred to visit as, as individuals, whether it was Amazon or CNN or YouTube or Netflix. Sites gave way to apps or applications, the functions embedded within websites. And we've distilled those apps even further to messaging applications like Snapchat. The user experience pattern that we're witnessing is one of independence and one of a customization of experience. Your experience with the internet is different from yours, which is different from yours. But that's just mechanical. What about behavioral? In my research about patterns of usage, how we interact with one another online, a few statistics leapt out to me. We're focusing on the millennial generation, now the largest generation in the workforce in US and Canada, ascendant, certainly, in the work world, but in society as well. 39% admit to interacting with their smart device over anything else, including people. 56% admit to breaking up with someone via text message. 80% feel perfectly comfortable with ghosting someone or walking away from a relationship without any further communication as though you never existed. But take a step back from those two last statistics for a moment because that's how relationships end. Consider now how relationships are starting. One of the most popular dating applications, Tinder, where compatibility is determined by the glance of a photo, typically in under three seconds, and your interest is indicated by a swipe to the right or left. These two combinations, these two sets, the mechanical and the behavioral, have us asking ourselves, are we naturally, are we preparing ourselves to naturally sequester ourselves from one another? Are we coming to view people in a more transactional sense than ever before? And at the dawn of the virtual age, these questions are more important than ever. Virtual reality will allow us to design every aspect of our experience, not just the environment we're standing in, but the people with which we're interacting. And who's to say we won't stray into the fantastical or the fantasy, create an environment customized to our specifications, or who's to say we won't modify our definition of time and elect to live in the past or the present, or that one moment in time. Maybe we feel like when we made a mistake and our life veered off in a direction it ought not to have. What if we had the opportunity to return to that moment in time and live the life we feel we ought to have led? Or go back and gain closure would it be possible? What if you never wanted to leave that moment? All of these questions beg the penultimate question at the dawn of the virtual reality age. What happens if we create a world that we find preferable to the one in which we're actually living? So what kind of awareness can we take into the virtual reality age? So, so that we ensure that we do this together, that we don't further divide ourselves. Step one is awareness. Know the degree to which we depend on our devices. Know virtual reality's awesome capabilities as an enabler of empathy. The New York Times created an opportunity to virtually immerse yourself in a Syrian refugee camp. So those people became not words in an article that you read or online, or in people in a video, you could actually virtually put yourself in their shoes and feel their experience. By being aware, we can dare to bend away from the trends of historical adoption and embrace the technology's powerful potential in a variety of industries, whether it's education, travel, training, real estate development. It has the opportunity to enable empathy in a way that we can barely imagine. Second, we can embrace experience. Of all of the statistics that, that 
I immerse myself in regarding usage patterns. And for all of the statistics and generalizations that are thrown upon millennials, one leapt out in particular. In an Eventbrite survey, greater than three out of four, 78% said that they prefer to spend their money on experiences over material goods. And over every demographic, the number has increased by 70% since 1987. We have an opportunity to embrace authentic experience and celebrate that. And in an age where people are discussing walls, bridging gaps is more important than ever. And actually experiencing the world has taken on a far greater meaning. And lastly, and this is the ultimate question, gain closure. Because if we've asked the penultimate question, then the ultimate question really is, what, not what do you need to do, or what do you need to say, but what's stopping you? Thank you. <laughs>